It is my great pleasure tonight to welcome Dr. Rowan Williams as our speaker in the third of our talks celebrating the 50 year anniversary of the founding of the lay community. So a big welcome to everyone here on Zoom. It's wonderful to see you. And we might be breaking all records tonight. And a big welcome to everyone who is there on the Facebook live stream. This is new for us. And especially I'd like to welcome monks and nuns of different Benedictine congregations who are joining us uh, tonight. Um, and I know that they're listening in. As we reflect on what it means to be a lay Benedictine in the 21st century, we are so pleased that Dr. Williams will be talking about the way of St. Benedict for all. Now we're going to give Dr. Williams a welcome in true community style. And so for this, I would like to pass over to Roger Duggan. Well, no so that actually, Doctor Williams, our governing minister, my main blesser, Envo, Rimi, I cross the way here to meet him now. Rudini Gide and Edward Hamlan at the Kairi of the Neb, er Guaitha with the new word and the eighth vine. Talking about Yon, I'm a Hamser Guerfo, a king with a to Croiso Canessa to me. Young Mary Alan Roger. Croiso. Well, that was so nice. Thank you so much, uh, Roger, for doing that on our behalf. And now I'm going to pass over to Michael Woodward, who is going to introduce Dr. Rowan Williams and who will facilitate the Q&A session at the end. And I know that Dr. Rowan, he said it to us when we were preparing for tonight, will welcome any questions from you. This is just to remind you that the whole event will be live streamed, including the Q and A sessions. So if you feel shy, you may not want. You may just want to send your questions through the chat rather than speak. And now I hand over to Michael. Thank you, Adam. Well, it's uh, very hard to follow Roger, but um, it's a deep joy to introduce Rome uh, without having to worry about the formalities of. Uh, <clears throat> the Lord Williams of Oystermouth or anything like that, because he's not one to stand upon his, his rights. Um, for us in Abergavenny, he's truly a local boy, um, having lit up our area as Bishop of Monmouth, based counterintuitively at St. Wooler's in Newport, where he was kindness itself uh, to me in uh, mentoring my first poetry publication, uh, contributing a foreword to the conference papers about Augustine Baker in 2000, and advising our ecumenical, uh, our, our ecumenical retreat team in, in the area. His stellar academic career was crowned, like C.S. Lewis before him, by progressing from Oxford to Cambridge, where people can spell Maudlin properly. Um, Rowan has now retired from, from college life to his native Wales amid great rejoicing. So many of our valued Welsh exports, like our water, you see, never return to us, but he has. <laughs> I suspect his, his level of activity will barely relent, and I know he will maintain his close interest in the, uh, being the, the, the chair of, of Christian Aid in the thriving religious community at Timaua, near Monmouth, and I'm sure in sharing his increasingly recognized poetic gifts. I'm looking very forward to finding his recent dual language rendering of the Welsh poetic phenomenon of Taliesin. And we look forward, I think, to a new collection of selected poems in, in November. Um, finally, Rowan, I think it is safe to say is the only person here this evening who could be congratulated for being arrested and fined for the monastic practice of singing psalm which makes him the perfect speaker to challenge us on our living out of monastic values in the Agora, the marketplace, wherever uh, that may now happen to be. Um, so over to you, Dr. Rowe. Well, thank you very much indeed, Michael. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tim. And thank you all of you for the opportunity to share this evening with you and the chance to say many happy returns to the lay community after 50 years of remarkable persistence, recreation, and hope. 
as I've said to Adam and to Michael, I don't particularly want to give a long lecture this evening, but I wanted to start the conversation going with a few thoughts on two particular subjects. One has something to do with stability, and the other has something to do with inclusion. But before getting round to those, let me step back for a moment and simply note in passing how very strange it is that there should be something called the lay community of St. Benedict, given that, of course, St. Benedict never envisaged anything else, really, except a lay community. Clearly, he expected there to be a priest or two around in the community. But we forget at our peril, something which I'm sure you're all very well aware of, that the early monastic movement is, above all, a lay movement. And the reluctance of the earliest monastics to get involved in actually running the church, a reluctance which was overcome fairly quickly, the reluctance of the first generation to get involved in that had something to do with that awareness that essentially this was a community of people who had no other title, no other dignity, but that of being members of the body of Christ. And the rationale of the monastery is, as we all know, to be a school of the Lord's service. And we might put that perhaps a little bit more what should I say, experimentally, by saying that it's also a kind of laboratory for Christian relation. And if you're going to have that, you can't have a community that's constantly preoccupied with what you might call the running of the institution. So initially, paradoxically, when you look at the rest of Christian history, it would have been very odd for a monk to become a bishop. Later on, of course, in the Eastern Church particularly, every bishop had to be a monk nominally and still has to be. But at first, this is an ideal of community life that takes a step sideways from the maintenance of the church as institution. Of course, it sets up its own institutions, and of course, it doesn't exist in a kind of vacuum isolated from the life of the institution more broadly. Nonetheless, as I said, we forget at our peril the kind of community this is. It exists to see what Christian interrelatedness looks like and feels like without certain kinds of pressure. It exists in order to say to the body of Christ as a whole, don't forget that the point of the body of Christ is a certain quality of relation. And when you find that you're putting your energies into the defense and maintenance of the institution at the expense of, rather than at the service of, that pattern of transformed relationships, then you need to think and to pray again. So, the comments I want to make this evening are really rather in that context. The context of understanding that a lay community is exactly what Benedict meant. He didn't mean to create a sort of reservoir of underemployed clergy. He didn't even mean to create a sort of hothouse of advanced contemplatives. There will be clergy there will be contemplatives by God's grace. But essentially, what he's interested in is how is it that human life together becomes transformed into the shape of the gospel and the kingdom? Now, one of the things that I think that might imply is that it's not really for the monastic community as such to shape a policy of the church at large. It exists to hold up a certain kind of mirror and to present a certain kind of challenge. And 
One of those challenges is the first theme I wanted to touch on, which was that of stability. It's something I touched on a little bit in the, the small book I wrote on St. Benedict recently, um, which is really just a rag bag of odds and ends of talks I've given here and there. Because it strikes me again and again whenever I go back to the rule that at the very heart of it is the notion that in the community, you don't have to earn your place all the time. As in a family, you belong and you don't have to go on reapplying for admission or justifying your place there. That, of course, is what ought to be true of the body of Christ as such. If we're serious in what we say about justification by faith, if we're serious in saying that what makes us members of the Christian body is an act of radical trust in Jesus Christ, rather than a sense of our own achievement, then that's obviously continuous with what's being said about the monastic community. And the monastic community, as I say, is a kind of experiment in seeing just how this feels. In the same way as marriage is an experiment in that. In a functioning marriage, you don't have to keep justifying your presence there. You don't have to keep earning. Something is promised. The other promises their company, as you promise yours. And that's the light in which I see stability. It's not just about not going up very much, not just even about staying physically in the same place. And that's something which in a dispersed community like this obviously needs thinking through. No, it's essentially about that commitment in which people say to one another, I'm not going to ask you all the time to justify our being together because we have made a promise to be there for one another in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you have a significant number of people living under the same roof, that's a pretty acute test of whether or not that can work and how it works. Just as in a marriage, it's a pretty acute test of whether that, that is real. But this, of course, is not just something which you can sum up and, as it were, tuck away as a monastic virtue. It's something which is potentially transformative of how we approach the entire world of human relations. We're pretty familiar with all that's said these days about the pressure on us all the time to market not only our products, but ourselves. And in one way or another, something like that has always been a problem. Otherwise, Benedict and others in the fourth and fifth centuries wouldn't have bothered with it. We're always under pressure to market ourselves, to produce something which will be appealing and acceptable to others. And that can lead to two different kinds of downward spiral a downward spiral into perpetual anxiety, a downward spiral into perpetual falsity. Stability as a characteristic of Benedictine life is something that pushes back against both those two kinds of poison, against anxiety and against falsity. Against anxiety, because you know that you're not always teetering on the brink of utter failure and loss. Falsity, because you know you can actually afford to be honest, because your honesty is not going to alienate the other and destroy the relation. That, of course, is not to say that there isn't an element of sheer common sense and emotional intelligence that comes in here. And that's also part of what you learn in the shared life. But at root, I would say that promise of stability is something which challenges some of the most problematic features of 
the world around and very much the world around us today. The online world, the capitalist world, the marketing world, the world in which everything can be commodified. And if commodified, can always be exchanged for something else. The world in which managing that commodified world successfully is your ticket to survival. In the face of all that, the Benedictine tradition says, just don't start from there. Start with this sense that it's conviction that something is promised, that something is there that does not have to be earned. Yes, it's simply the grace that Jesus himself announces, but in the sense that the Benedictine life has that laboratory quality to it, let's see what that looks like and feels like in the difficulties of daily practice, in the prosaic routine of Benedictine life. In some of what I wrote in the book, I rather underlined what I call the prosaic quality of Benedict's presentation. He's not an ecstatic writer. He's very seldom an eloquent writer, though occasionally he is. From time to time, you have those flashes of bone dry humor, like the famous comment on monks and alcohol. We read that wine is no drink for monks, but monks these days cannot be persuaded of this. And you sense that can't have passed without a certain flicker across the face in the fifth or sixth century. But essentially, he's talking about prose. He's talking about that daily routine, not as something dreary and empty, somehow supplemented by a more exciting spiritual life elsewhere, but talking about how you might live the bread and butter of ordinary human relations in a way that uncovered a depth of divine promise in them. And I suppose that really is why he writes as he does about the tools of good works and about the grades of humility and so forth. These are ways of uncovering in the everyday the depth of divine promise and divine presence. And stability is an aspect of that and an aspect which I would say has an evangelistic quality here in the sense that it announces good news to a society that is hectic, anxious, and often false. But then what might be said about what I've called inclusion? The second theme I wanted to touch on very briefly. Benedict makes a great deal of hospitality, as we all know. And although he takes it for granted that people will want to be around monastics, he goes a stage further in saying that the casual visitor is someone who needs to be regarded as and welcomed as Christ. It's yet another way of talking about how what I call the promise and presence of God is uncovered. So far from this community being envisaged as one in which everyone has all the resources they need simply and strictly within the community, the recognition that the guest comes with the face of Christ is tantamount to saying, the guest is always bringing something you couldn't have found for yourself or invented for yourself, because that's what Christ does. Anybody who's spent time in the guest house of a Benedictine monastery will be very much aware of the strange people who gather there, or should I rather say, the other strange people who gather there. And that's exactly as it should be. The strangeness, the unexpectedness of the visitor has to be seen as the strangeness of Christ because, precisely because, the community is not just a self-sufficient perpetual motion machine in which all the energy is generated internally and preserved internally. Hospitality is not simply about allowing a privileged few visitors 
a glimpse of a higher life. It's also a matter of how the community is nourished. And my sense from monastics I know is that that is something taken deeply seriously. And this takes me back a bit to where I started, the, the significance of the Benedictine community as a lay community that doesn't have to work out the church's policy. Guests in the monastery are not examined on their piety and probity before they arrive. Guests are guests, and pious or not, there they are, showing the face of Christ. What their relationship to the church may be is probably anybody's guess. It'll vary wildly, and yet that diversity which is brought is part of what nourishes the community, part of what renews it, part of what, I won't say justifies it because that's quite the wrong word, but part of what, again, uncovers what it's there for, which is precisely to give the message, you do not have to earn the right to be here. Now, Clearly, if we're talking about the practicalities of monastic life and community, there will be all sorts of issues, all sorts of difficulties that this raises. There are breakdowns in relationship. There are failures in that promise and presence. There are members of a community and there are guests who are not manageable because our human resources are not infinite. And yet the spirit of Benedict is one which makes a circle back to that fundamental issue. How do we live our lives in such a way as to declare that people do not have to earn the right to be human together? How do we articulate the truth that the stranger is a source of nourishment, not of threat? And I suppose I focus on these themes, partly because, and you'll help me here, I know, partly because that's where some of the, some of the energy and the vision is bound to come in a dispersed community like this one, a community that can't rely on being together in the same place all the time, but one which can exemplify both of those monastic virtues. A steady and committed being there for one another. A readiness to go on reminding one another that their place, their dignity, and their security does not have to be earned and certainly does not have to be fought for. And that awareness that the outsider, the stranger, the person posing and asking difficult questions and difficult issues is not a menace, not a disruption, but somehow carries the presence of Christ. A Christ who certainly can disrupt, but who disrupts in order to reground and refund the integrity, the energy of the community itself. And that's what I see dispersed communities doing. Declaring in the world what the model of Christ's body really amounts to. Many people, perhaps not enough people, will say Christianity is not, first of all, a system, but first of all, a network of relations. The Nicene Creed, which I happily recite with full conviction every Sunday, wasn't actually written on Easter Day. First of all, a set of relationships appear so extraordinary, so counterintuitive, that it takes a few centuries to work out the words you need in order to crystallize what's really been going on in the event of Christ. <clears throat> 
and that's why again people have sometimes said it's not a matter of people converting to a set of beliefs but discovering a fresh identity in the light of which beliefs change that's part of the significance all the time of christian community life whether it's the life simply of a parish whether it's the life of an intentional community of one kind or another and there would be many ways into thinking about this but because benedict has those two themes of stability and hospitality so clearly unambiguously flagged in what he writes it's because of that that i choose to focus on them in these stray thoughts about the benedictine life for all a life which to think for a moment about the two senses of that phrase for all a life which is not restricted to members of an ordained group or indeed people who have reached a certain high level of spiritual practice but is first and foremost a practice for beginners as he says and all those who take us too far afield i'm always aware thinking of that phrase of the way in which Buddhists will talk about beginner's mind as one of the things you actually need to achieve. You may come with a huge array of what you think of as skills, capacities, and gifts. But in order to grow, you have to achieve or be given beginner's mind. And maybe that's one way of looking at the rule. But the second sense of that little phrase, for all, of course, is that the life lived under the rule of St. Benedict is a life which exists for all. That is, it exists for the sake of the human society around. It exists for the sake of a society constantly sucked back into the distortions I've mentioned of anxiety and falsity. It exists in order to declare that honest community, stable community, and generous community are possibilities for the human world. And although they may not be spectacularly actual in every Benedictine community in the world, and rumor has it that they're not, nonetheless, that's what these communities are for. And that's what the lay community is for also. A sign and a gift, a laboratory in which some very remarkable bits of chemistry are thrown together, producing the strange result of people willing to be there with and for one another, and willing to be hospitable, to be transformed, both by that consistency of gift and mutuality, and by that willingness to receive as well as to give. So I think I might pause there if that's all right and just see what people have come up with. I've noticed a couple of comments coming up already um, and there may be lots of other questions, but thank you for listening so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. Thank you for a very um, stimulating and um, challenging talk um, as you say we've got one or two things in the in the chat um, <clears throat> so feel free to add your questions um, now as, as we go along but um, uh, Tom Tom uh, you can see said uh, to be a Christian without any questions being asked is something we must re rediscover very quickly no thank you very much indeed Tom um, that's that's a deeply searching and challenging thing to say because it takes us again right back to, to the gospel itself, doesn't it? To the, the gospel narratives. We confuse the idea of Christianity being a demanding path with the idea that we must somehow make demands on people before they step on the path. And to trust the grace and love of God 
to transform people in its own way at its own pace is very hard work if we're concerned to police and organize other people's lives, which we love to do. I'm struck in the gospels by the fact that, and some of you will have heard me say this before, Jesus doesn't seem to ask anything but trust in the first instance from those who come to him. And to use the example I was quoting the other day in another context, when the, um, the 10 lepers are healed and only one comes back to say thank you, the Samaritan, Jesus doesn't then sort of restore the leprosy of the other nine because they haven't lived up to expectations. Jesus has given the gift and it stays given. And one of those 10 has begun to explore what it might mean. And I've toyed with the idea that maybe three or four years later, a couple of the others thought, you know, wait a minute. I may have missed the point about all that healing stuff. Maybe I need to do something about my life. Maybe I need to let gratitude pervade it a bit more and so on. And that of course does take us to Catherine's question, doesn't it? Um, who points out that um, she's read the book about gratitude that I wrote with Joan Chittister. And would you be able to say if, or does gratitude, what part gratitude plays in our and other communities? I find it profound in the context of suffering. Oh yes, yes indeed. Um, I would say gratitude is very near the, the very heart of all discipleship and therefore very near the heart of this particular mode of discipleship. Because we are always, so to speak, trying quite unsuccessfully to catch up with the scale and character of a gift that's exceeded expectation. And when we run out of words, when we embark on what the textbooks call apophatic theology, negative theology, it's not that there's not enough to say, but there's too much to say. Our words will never get it, never capture it. And that's a sign of gratitude, which is why I've sometimes argued that so-called negative theology really belongs in the context of the Eucharist, because that's where we, we finally have so little to say that all we can do is eat and drink. So yes, gratitude is basic. And in the face of suffering, so complex, isn't it? Because you don't want to go around saying to people, oh, be glad of your sufferings. You don't want to sound like Pollyanna. But when I've come across people who are trying to pray in the middle of really acute suffering, I think what I'm often hearing is a deep sense that something is given and it's not at all what you might want or expect. Not that the suffering is given in order to, you know, for its own sake, but that in suffering, in the inevitable suffering that happens in human life, something is given, the sense of a God who is not turning away. And when we're faced with acute suffering, maybe that is what we give thanks for. The God who doesn't turn away. Once again, the God whose relation with us is stable. So, very good question. Um, Michael, shall I go on reading down the, the yes, question? If today? you're happy to do that, then please. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll have a go at that. Um, Liz asks, is the term beginner's mind the same as trust or something different? Very good question. And I, you know, I don't want to pretend I fully understand the way in which my Buddhist friends use this term beginner's mind. But let's think for a moment, what does trust entail? Trust entails putting aside some of the stories we'd like to tell about the situation we're in, stories we might want to tell about somebody else, and just letting the reality establish itself in front of us to the extent that we're willing to say, I don't understand, but I'm willing to take a step forward and not try to absorb or conquer or domesticate what's there. That's trust. And I think some of what the Buddhists mean by beginner's mind is just that laying down or setting aside. There's a koan, one of these sort of Zen axioms that are used in meditation, which I remember I was once given on a retreat 
by a, a Buddhist friend. Um, when you come to meditation, lay everything down. Question, but what if you bring nothing? Lay that down too. It's a sort of letting go of expectation. And trust is a bit like that in some ways. So I, I think there might be, might be some balance there. Um, now then. Perhaps those um, uh, next two might go um, together. We've got the observation about um, uh, you not mentioning prayer in, in your talk. And then hmm. John Williams um, asks you to speak about contemplation in Christian life. Yes, I'll, I'll have a go at that. Um, not mentioning prayer, yes. I ought to say, whoops, I suppose. <laughs> but I suppose that I don't foreground it, partly because it's one of those things that the rule of Benedict just assumes you do, like the washing up or the gardening. You just do it. And as he famously says, if you feel like praying, go and pray, which is not unlike the, the kind of style and feel that you have in some of the stories about the Desert Fathers, isn't it? Um, the, the young monk who's having really, really difficult spiritual problems and goes to his spiritual father and the old man says, well, my advice is eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired and keep saying the, keep saying the Psalms, you know, keep taking the tablets. Mm -hmm. And I think Benedict would have said in one of his most wonderful phrases, I'd never despair of the mercy of God. So prayer belongs in all that. And I guess that the, the things I was trying to articulate about uncovering the presence and promise of God in the circumstances around, I'd say that's, that's absolutely bound in with contemplation. Again, the Eastern Christian tradition, which is the deep hinterland of so much of what Benedict writes, the Eastern Christian tradition says that a contemplative, receptive attitude to the natural world around is part of your preparation for the reception of God's truth in contemplation. So that careful, as we might say, mindful negotiating of the day-by-day -day business of community and practical life is part of what opens you up for the contemplation of the divine, the deeper absorption or assimilation of the life of Christ in you, because that's what contemplation is, isn't it, at the end of the day? You're not trying to learn to look more clearly at some distant divine reality that occasionally you glimpse beyond the clouds. You're trying to allow the life of Christ given you in baptism to surge up steadily like water rising in the well towards the light that is the Father. And that happens in prayer and it happens in the activities of daily life, that Trinitarian coming together of the source and the response that is the Father and the Son in the energy and reality of the Holy Spirit. So I, I wouldn't want anybody to draw too many conclusions from what I didn't say about prayer and contemplation, because I think part of what Benedict is saying is, first of all, learn to do what needs to be done. Like the Desert Fathers in the East is saying, you learn to do what needs to be done, both in small and great things. You learn to look at the world around and people around you, letting them be themselves as they come from the hand of God, not trying to devour them into your own agenda. And then mysteriously, your mind and your heart are opened up to what the Easterners call theology. That is the real divine logos coming alive more fully in you, I think. Thank you. Now there's, there's a very interesting question from Paul Inwood. Um, 
but balancing the fact that you don't have to earn your place against the danger of complacency and missing out on the need for lifelong ongoing formation. Oh yes, yes, again, really, really pointed and important question. Um, the danger of complacency, the anything goes attitude, is not, I think, what stability and promise and all the rest of it means. But of course, that needs refreshing and renewing, as once again it does in any marriage. You can become complacent, I suppose, if you think that the encounters in which you're involved are not really going to change you. But the point of this kind of stability in community, and indeed in marriage, the point is that you're there for one another so that you may grow, so that you may change. The stability is precisely not stasis, frozenness. And that does need to be dusted off again and again, because it is easier, yes, to be complacent and to miss out on that need for formation. Um, so it's really rather like the whole question of how we approach one another with the generosity of Christ. We're not saying it doesn't matter what, what you've done or what you're doing or that everything's perfectly all right. It's really saying I'm taking you with absolute seriousness as you are here and now. What change may need to happen, what change may be possible, we'll see. For now, the welcome is there. And that I think is not a kind of laxity or um, false tolerance, but recognizing that you can't begin a relationship without that basic seriousness. I'm listening to you. I'm trying to see you a little bit as God sees you and to allow God's welcome to be there in my own words and deeds. And I'm also trying to receive what you're giving me. And you start from there. But yes, a complacency stasis is a temptation, no doubt about it. Paul Brady, um, says, I woke up today at 3 a.m. wondering why I had never heard the voice of Thomas Merton. Discovering I was five when he died, I quickly found a recording of his teaching on prayer. Listening, I heard him describe his prayer as doing nothing. An infant, he said, doesn't know he or she is an infant, so he, she just is. I'm really interested in what you do or try to be when you pray. What is the nature and truth of your attempt to pray? Do you do something, say something, or like Merton, do or say nothing? Just listening or well um, the obvious answer to that is I suppose back to Thomas Merton and uh, read more of him but what's he saying there certainly he's saying and it perhaps does relate a little bit to phrases I've used earlier part of what he's saying surely is when we come to prayer we're not embarking on the long journey from earth to heaven. Because before they even call, I answer, as God says in Isaiah. And as Augustine says in the Confessions, God is our home. And the problem is when we are away from home in ourselves, God remains there waiting for us in the depths of what we are. St. Teresa of Avila says much the same. So certainly there's a very important sense in which prayer is trying to stop traveling in the sense of wandering around looking for something interesting, to try and draw ourselves into where we actually are. And there's a lot of energy and a lot of effort that goes into that as every praying person would agree, mopping their brows. Doing nothing is amazingly hard work because our default setting is to do something. Don't just stand there, do something. 
look busy. And when we come to prayer, the most significant recognition, I think, is God is there before we are. And when, since you ask a partly personal question, when I compose myself for prayer in the morning, what I have to try first of all to connect with is that the flow of reality, of life, of energy within my body is already the gift of God, who is already active and already, because God is the endless exchange of Trinitarian life, God is already adoring and loving God in me. And I have, by trying to still my mind, quiet my body, regularize my breath, simply to try and align with that ongoing supporting reality. Now, in order to do that, there are practices that help. There are physical practices, the posture you adopt, the breathing rhythm. There are practices that just draw you back into the center, certain words, certain formulae. There are images you can have in front of you for certain moments where you need to be reconnected with a deeper and fuller reality. But all of those serve essentially to take you back to that basic place where God is already at work. As I said earlier, God the Son eternally adoring and glorifying God the Father in God the Spirit. And that's why um, in front of me when I try to pray is always that very famous Russian icon, Rublev's icon of the Holy Trinity. Because as so many commentators have observed, there is a, a kind of space opened up by the shape of the angelic figures and the shape of the table, which as it were says, come and sit down on that side of the table and you will be enfolded in the same rhythm and the same line of reality. So that's a little bit of what I, I suppose I'm trying to do in terms of doing nothing in prayer. And maybe that's something of what Merton's talking about. Um, yes, Adam and Barbara are asking a couple of questions here. There are a couple of comments there also, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but let's take Adam and Barbara. Could I please expand, they ask, on a sentence from the book when I say, the monastic ideal stands in opposition to anything which looks like a tribal church. You also said something else, the ecumenical significance of monasticism, that it is a church unified simply in the word of God spoken and heard. Well, yes, um, those two points are very, as you might guess, very closely bound up with one another. The tribal church thing, um, I owe the phrase, I suppose, to my very good friend, Peter Selby, who used to be Bishop of Worcester, who wrote a book called Belonging, Challenges to a Tribal Church, in which he wrote very pungently, as was his custom, about um, tribalism in the church, partisanship, zero-sum games, exclusivity, the I'm a real Christian and you're not, I'm a real Catholic and you're not, I'm a real Anglican and you're not, all those games that we play. And when I said earlier that monasticism as a lay community stepped sideways a bit from the actual running of the institutional church, I think it also steps sideways from that sort of thing. In a very important sense, it's crucial that monasticism shouldn't be churchy, if you see what I mean. It's there to be itself. It's not there to take sides, to campaign. It's not there to be a sort of flagship for a certain style of Christian life. It's there to be what it is. And that's why I particularly love communities that have deeply ecumenical vocations and are not trying to make points. Teze, obviously, the great 
Bose community in northern Italy. These communities that just step sideways, that look a little bit quizzically at the internal civil wars and cultural wars of the church and say, yeah, okay, but actually we've got something more interesting to do, which is to live out the gospel together. So, you know, bear with us, but we're not going to be conscripted. Another friend of mine, Greg Wolf, the um, American writer and biographer, wrote a, an article a few years ago, it was called On Being a Conscientious Objector in the Culture Wars. And that's, you know, that's not a bad slogan, I think, for thinking of, of the relationship I've got in mind here. And yes, the ecumenical significance, being together under the word of God, what unites a monastic community is, you know, day by day, is common work, but that common work involves that very particular kind of work, that very foundational kind of work, which is gathering under the word, saying the Psalms, listening to scripture. And that sort of daily rolling on discipline of listening to the word, that is the language in common that's shared and that makes the community itself. So I think that's, that's part of what I mean by thinking about the ecumenical significance. And it is so striking in the last century or so, the role that's been played by monastic communities of one kind or another, not least Benedictine communities in ecumenism. I've been uh, doing a bit of work in the last couple of years on the, the first round of Anglican Roman Catholic conversations, the Malin conversations, which started in Belgium just a hundred years ago this year. And there's going to be a big event in Belgium this December to celebrate that um, centenary. But one of the one of the people who was involved um, in the background of those conversations was the great um, Belgian Benedictine Lombard Baudouin, who was one of the founders of the monastery at Cheftogne in Belgium, which, which began with an expressly ecumenical purpose. In that context, an ecumenism about Eastern and Western Christendom. But it's not the only Benedictine community, not, certainly not the only religious community, which has been a credible context for ecumenical encounter. I think just because of that, that, that sense of standing together in the presence of God's word. Sheila Hollins reminds me that she came to a trialogue conference, which I organized with um, the late and deeply lamented and much loved Murray Cox. And the trialogue conference, for those who don't know, was a, an annual meeting of people involved in theology and literature and therapy. Um, Murray Cox, who was for a quarter of a century senior consultant psychiatrist at Broadmoor, was a prophetic and brilliant figure who inspired this encounter. So Sheila asks, how important are the contributions of other disciplines, including psychoanalysis and literature, to our understanding of community? Well, massively important, obviously, because anything that really serves our understanding of the human condition is food and drink for communal living. And many religious communities, not only monastic communities, have I suspect discovered this the hard way by trying to live as if the worlds of say literature and psychoanalysis are secular and irrelevant. And if you don't use the best resources God gives for getting a rich and three-dimensional picture of what humanity is like. Don't be too surprised if people find they haven't got anywhere to put their deepest emotions and their most complicated reactions and start flailing around and ultimately going away. Don't be surprised. The challenge for the church at large, for the religious community in a very particular sense, 
is I think to show that there is room enough in this world of Christian belief, and room enough in this world of monastic practice for all the complexities, the twists and turns of human awareness. You don't have to hang up the more complicated bits of your psyche at the door when you come in. So I would say in response to Sheila's question, very crucial question, that yes, there is huge importance to this. And going back to Merton, I think that's, that's what we see in his evolution, isn't it? Someone who initially comes into the monastic life full of a, a deep conviction that he's got to leave an awful lot at the door. And having pushed it out very noisily at the front door, he finds it insistently knocking at the back door as the decades go on. And in the last few years of his life, he has learned more to open the back door and with lots of risks and lots of full starts to embrace what's there. Mm. And then there's a question, if I've got time briefly, from Alain and Nicole. When people join a stable community and then leave, what does this say to or about the members of the community left behind? <laughs> Fascinating question. Um, and, you know, I've, as someone who's been confessor and warden to various religious communities over the years, not an academic one, I must say, there can be a sense of failure, can't there? And I, I guess that may be in the background of the question, a sense that we, we couldn't cope or there may be a projection of the failure onto the person leaving, so that they're regarded as having somehow betrayed that stability and solidarity. And I think the only thing I'd really want to say here is, if someone does decide that they're called to leave, and I do underline called to leave, because I think that is what sometimes happens, the gift they are giving to the community is one of those moments of truth when it ought to be possible for the community to step back and say, did we live out our calling fully with this person? Did we liberate them as we should have? And if we didn't, we've got work to do. Just as the person leaving may say, and again, I've, I've heard this said, I'm not saying that um, I, I was so oppressed and repressed in communities that I had to go for my own soul's sake, though you hear that from time to time. But often people saying more, ah, something in me wasn't ready for that or wasn't able to respond and I had to find it in some other way. So I suppose I would say on both sides, try to park the blame and anxiety side of it and focus on what's to be learned and how growth might come from it all round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. And that is um, extraordinary timing because we're just coming up to uh, 9 p.m. and we've got a, a bit of a mission to um, conclude at, at 9. So I'll just, um, uh, yeah, thank you again so much for, for the talk and just hand back to Adam and Barbara. So um, I would like to thank uh, Rowan for his uh, talk tonight. Um, I think what strikes me is the depth and the beauty of his understanding of the spirit of St. Benedict. And I do wholeheartedly recommend his book, The Way of St. Benedict. Um, and it is if you want to continue to um, understand what uh, Rowan is saying to us about the way of St. Benedict, and it's so relevant uh, to us as, as a community. Uh, you talked at the beginning, Rowan, about uh, the lay community um, inspiring people with hope. Well, tonight you have inspired us uh, with hope uh, about the meaning of what we are trying to do and, and sort of working our way through. Always a work in progress, but uh, just feel that um, you've given us so much inspiration. You've also given us a challenge uh, to live that Christian life of stability and inclusion, uh, the way that you focused on those two elements uh, of the rule, which uh, give life 
give life to members and give life to other people who come into contact with our community. So thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts for giving us your time. It has been a wonderful, inspiring evening. I'm sure we're all going to reflect on what you've said over a, a long time and take that learning uh, to heart and what you've just said to us. So thank you very, very much indeed. I'd just like to ask everyone to uh, show a reaction of thanks uh, and on your screens. It's about the only way we can do it, but just a big clap to uh, Rowan for tonight. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for all these wonderful questions, which have really made me think and, and reflect further. And it's been a great gift. So delight to be with you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.